So this session is about communication during uh, redesign. Uh, I'm joking for all the other sessions uh, in the other one. So I'm Mike Kirby. Uh, I work at the University of Maine up in Ordo. Uh, this is my first time on this campus. And um, I've been working on websites since before there were websites. My first website was BBS in the 1980s that people were dialed up into and actually read text and not look at pictures. Uh, and then there were some redesigns that went well and others that did not. And the common theme with the ones that went well is good communication. And the ones that did not, they were trying to work in a vacuum. So a little bit about University of Maine's website. We are a multi-multi-site. Uh, we have uh, two multi-site environments that are public at the moment. We're looking at spinning up a third one. Uh, the primary one that we work on is umaine.edu. There's about 350 public websites in it. 425 actual websites, some of them are in progress. Uh, decentralized content management. We support a team of you know, 900 or so different users of one sort or another that are in there with their other websites. Uh, but we centralize the application management. So we don't let anybody install their own plugins, and we now just have the one theme that people use. Uh, cooperative extension, which is our statewide uh, outreach to the community. That is on another multi-site network um, that has about, about 40 to 60 websites. And it's separate for a variety of needs, but shares the code base. So I'm not gonna go too much more into this. Um, our digital communications team, we're a team of three. Uh, Brandy's in the room here. All three of us are down here at WordCamp today. And we support a campus of 12,000 with um, focusing on training and communications as opposed to actually doing the content work for folks. So the detail is not to go over the project itself, um, but to talk about the communication. So this is just a quick timeline of the redesign. We started in the summer, fall of 2014 with pre-planning. Uh, winter, spring was the communications piece. And then summer to fall in 2015, we launched. And then there was some post-launch communication. And, of course, that was several years ago, so I've updated a little bit to, for this talk. Um, as an opportunity to migrate to a modernized WordPress implementation, we eliminated legacy plugins and audited every website for web accessibility at the time it was migrated. Uh, this process was just completed for UMaine websites last spring. Our cooperative extension websites continue to be migrated. Um, that project's managed by their communications team, our support. And some migrating sites were using specialized WordPress themes. Our goal was to get everybody into a single theme, not even have child themes off of that. And uh, that was achieved. Um, at times we added options to the themes customizer uh, so that we were, uh, that were only available to uh, super admins. So you know, we can tweak the site a little bit for sites like University of Maine using the art, Google Library, etc. But individual users can't don't have access to that kind of high level changing of the theme. Um, positive word of mouth about how this went has uh, gotten a lot of outlying sites into our theme. So we had um, the Climate Change Institute, uh, the Marine Sciences School, other sites that were large that were outside of WordPress altogether. They had their own content management systems and they didn't want to come into WordPress the first, before we started this project because they saw it as restrictive and not you know, up to stuff for what they wanted. Uh, they came on board because they saw how well the project went and you know, we built a great thing for it. So, um, so pre-project communication. This is where you really have to start, is taking stock. Um, get to know the land. Um, it's important to reach out to your stakeholders, obviously, but that's hard to do because you want to you get an earful from them when they, uh, especially if you have a site that's, you know, people are grousing about. Um, <laughs> determine what the pain points are. That's important. That's what you're doing a redesign for is to address these pain points. But it's also important to uh, look at what's working well because you don't want to just throw something out that you didn't think people were using and they were using. Our big example was uh, the A to Z directory that we had on a website. I thought, oh, this is silly. If the site's well designed and has good search, who needs to go to an A to Z directory? But no. 
that was consistently the top thing people said they liked about our website was being able to go to a directory and not just rely on search to tell them where the student records department website was. Um, at UMaine, we assembled the web advisory group. Uh, we brought in to the table constituents from administration, IT, resources, education. Um, it's challenging sometimes because some of these groups are going to be very busy and they don't have time to give you time. So it's good to find proxies for those, like faculty. We didn't really have faculty at the table uh, for the redesign. Instead, we found people that had the same mix of needs that did have time. So people that were you know, in uh, you know, professional development groups at University of Maine came in and they, they filled the same needs, but they you know, were able to make time for these meetings. This group that we have continues to meet six times a year. Um, and yeah, as I said, while, while discussion of pain points helped us understand what should be addressed, it was equally important to understand what's working well. Setting scope, that's the key with this. Let people know what they're going to be expected to chime in on. Um, and also let them know what you're doing. Because when you say redesign, people insert their own opinion as to what that means. And then when you don't meet that, then to them you fail, even though you never intended to address that. So begin with your end in mind, stick to the scope you set, and make sure the project is clearly communicated as the project is pitched, approved, and kicked off. You don't want to pitch a redesign project and the people will say, yeah, we'll pay for that. And then they say, what do you mean search wasn't included? Or what do you mean e-commerce, you know, we don't have e-commerce with this. So, Make sure we, at UMaine, uh, we made it very clear. We are not changing from WordPress. We, WordPress was working for us, we just needed to take it to the next level. Uh, we made it clear that we weren't gonna adopt a new search engine. We were using Google custom search engine. That would stay the same. If we decided later that we needed a better search engine, we would do that as a separate project. E-commerce, we weren't gonna spin up, roll e-commerce, WooCommerce into our theme all of a sudden because you know, that would be, uh, a little bit too much for this project. We're now working on you know, a uh, orders.umain.edu multi-site environment that's going to be a separate project that will help for you know, workshop registrations or uh, minor e-commerce ordering kind of things. Um, most importantly, yeah, we determined that we shouldn't try to launch everything at once. We weren't you know, with Umain. We had a large multi-site environment. Um, we decided it was an opportunity to migrate to a better WordPress stack altogether. So we identified a set of key sites that would um, help us shake out any shortcomings in our solution. And follow, we followed it up with a post-launch project to migrate the hundreds of sites into the new theme. So we had a set of about 20 or so sites, so our core, you know, news, calendar, homepage, admissions, uh, those type of sites, we brought them over all at once and then reached out to the community and started a migration project. That might not be possible with every redesign. It's, if you're a small shop, then do the whole thing at once. But if you're in a large, if it's daunting to even think about launching your whole site into a new design at once, see if there's an opportunity to do that a piece at a time. So, during the project, <coughs> This is where you loop back in those people that helped you discover what you needed to do and uh, you know, make sure that you're hitting what they needed. You know, design with your audience in mind. Just ensure that you're addressing their pain points. Um, for UMaine, you know, decisions were on the design were made within our broader department of marketing communications. And we had to run it on the flagpole step with senior leadership. We were actually at a great point there where senior leadership really wasn't interested in micromanaging uh, the website, so we didn't have to sh show them, here's the three different you know, directions we're going to go, pick one. We chose that, and then it was later that we said, this is the one we chose, yeah, and then they said, yeah, that looks good. Um, also, the web advisory group that we set up, uh, we made it clear that we weren't going to be expecting them to chime in on every little decision about the project. We just were going to give them status updates. And that status update was an opportunity for them to say, you know, I have a concern that I don't see being met. Um, but you get into analysis paralysis if you make people think, 
but they have to chime in. Um, at the previous job, I had a coworker who shared that whenever she's given something to review, like a document, she always finds something to change to show that she looked at it. <laughs> and if you have somebody like that, oh then you're going to just be getting somebody that's going to focus on this one little thing that they may not even cared about, but they wanted to show that they were paying attention and looking at what you asked them to look at. So yeah, our web advisory group is convened regularly for progress reports and updates on the emerging look of the site, but only occasionally, occasionally where they ask to weigh in on design choices. Uh, the communication plan for the general internal audience uh, outside of our core folks. That's, um, you know, when, when your developers are working on actually building the new theme, usually your communicators are not having to do as much about saying as to deciding what to do. So this is your opportunity to take the stock and tell everybody what the developers are doing and share the excitement that the new site is coming. Um, this is a great time, yeah. Map out the key dates in this plan and ensure you have adequate time to prepare and present so the community has time to digest and accept the coming changes. Um, really, with our project, we kicked it off in earnest in February of 2015. And it was by June of 2015 that we had all the design choices made, pretty much. So July was when we really started that push out to tell people this is what's coming. And by then you had screenshots, hopefully, of what it was going to look like. Um, so yeah, map out your key dates. And then plan an informational session, something like this, where take all comers to come and sit and listen to you talk. Um, that's, you know, we did that in mid-July. We sent out invitations to the campus community. It was a great time during the summer. Students aren't here. Faculty actually has some down, you know, well, they'll argue that they, they never have downtime. Um, but at least they weren't having to convene classes usually. So, um, so that informational session, that's, you know, start with the why. That's, people are going to wonder, why are you doing this? So tell them, this is why we have to redesign. For us, it was very clear. Uh, we had to redesign because mobile. Um, we had a website that started organically in 2009 in WordPress, and by 2015, it was just, it, we couldn't just shoehorn mobile into the so we want to start fresh. Um, share screenshots. Don't try to do a live demo of the site, uh, if you can at all help it. Uh, not just because Murphy's Law, uh, if you do a demo of a, lot, some, of a product, that's when the errors are going to pop up and it's going to look like they're always there, even if they weren't. So just use screenshots. But even more importantly, if you're using screenshots, folks are going to um, look at the screen and they'll realize that they can't click to go in deeper, and they'll just say, okay, I'll look at it later when I can click and go deeper. If they see you can click and go deeper, they'll say, I want to see what that is. And then all of a sudden your whole talk is derailed as everybody starts to wonder, why is this page doing this instead of that? It's like, well, that's because we hadn't flushed that out yet, because this is just a demo. Um, yeah, give them a handout to take away. That's very important. It helps structure what you're going to say. Um, and then it gives them something to take back with them so that they're not relying on their own interpretation of what you said. If you just give a talk and somebody takes notes, they'll write down something and then they'll get back to, and they'll be asked, well, what did they talk about? And they'll see what they wrote as a note and they'll suddenly expand on that. And when they expand on what they wrote notes on, they might not be accurate at all in what you meant. But if they have a take, if you have a handout, they can photocopy the handout, or even better, point you to point their coworkers to a website to get their own copy of the handout, and you have control of that message. At least there, you're saying, see the handout? That's what we said we were doing. So. Also, you want to make sure that you give them kind of a nice structure to that handout. You, you know, tell them what's changing. Tell them what's staying the same. Tell them when it's happening. And then end with what they need to do. Because that's probably why they're there in the first place. So communication during the project, uh, the post-communication plan, once you're launched. When, as the launch approaches, you want to alert your audience. Um, update your homepage, 
home pages of sites affected, like in our case, because we have these four sites that we're watching, we want to make sure that people that were entering the site through those sub-sites were aware that something was going to be changing soon. Um, to communicate that the coming change you know, is going to be there for your frequent visitors. Uh, if your whole site's flipping at once, then you probably want to look at Google Analytics and identify your entry points to the website, the most common ones. Um, if you're anything like a campus like this, um, I, I know some of the people at WordCamp came in through the door that was open, that had the vendors and all that, and some people came through another door and had to wander through and find their way over here. Well, your website's the same way. Not everybody's going to come through the home page. They're going to come through the page that they got to their Google. Google Analytics will tell you what those pages are so you can put alerts on them so that even if they didn't come to your home page, they're still aware that the change is coming. It's a launch day. That's clear your calendar if you're going to launch the website, even if you're not the developer guy, because you're going to be hearing from folks. You announce the launch to your campus community. Uh, do not assume they're going to open the home page and notice the update on their own. We actually had somebody a year and a half after we launched, and we were doing this migration, and I contacted them and said, hey, um, we'd like to get your site migrated to the new design. I said, there's a new design? And you know, we assumed that everybody was, always goes to our home page, but you know, there's lots of constituents that only open their page. Um, Involve your campus news team, if you have one. Uh, this talk was originally for the university, but any you know, company that has public relations, press releases, or whatever, involve those folks. They're your communicators. They all have a good handle on you know, getting the word out. Um, keep them up to date uh, as the sites migrate from older theme to new. Um, for us, we made announcements on campus news as each site was getting launched to kind of help show you know, these sites were changing. To a degree. I mean, after the first year of migrating sites, we got gotten all the big ones, uh, and we stopped doing that because it seemed a little silly to say, hey, the Black Bear Marathon website has now changed into a new theme. Um, and expect the unexpected. Uh, when we launched, the site went up, new site, and immediately crashed because we had tested the new stack, but we hadn't tested the new stack totally with the live traffic. And we set up the old site again while we did some fine tuning of micro caching and all sorts of technical things that I knew nothing about. And we got it back up. So that was the other thing, was make, making sure that your communicators are out there. Your, if your news team sent out the press release the moment you sent out the, set, set up the new site, that might not have been the best idea. Um, wait till you've got it up. It's been up for a few hours, it looks stable, then you can get the word out. We launched the new site. But if it went up, came down, and then goes up later in the day, later in the day is the one time you want to send, send that word out. So post-launch support training. Um, if your project results in a redesigned site in one fell swoop, post-launch communications are going to be focused on support and further training support. Um, it's not a web publication that's pushed out the door on a deadline and you work on other initiatives. It's a communication channel that must be constantly fed and managed. Um, visible ongoing training and updates on the success of the website will reinforce this perception among those who are not as focused on the web as you are and your immediate team. Um, with us, we started these weekly or weekly WordPress uh, trainings. I think I'm going to talk about that in another slide coming up here. So. So site migrations, that's what for us, if you did them all at once, this is not pertaining to you, but you'll be launching new sites perhaps in your multi-site environment. So um, if you did not flip the entire website as part of this redesign, you'll have more sites to migrate to come. Managing the migration process involves communication pieces. Develop templates for emails we'll be sending out as part of the process. So um, migration kickoff, proposed timeline, status updates, check-ins, approvals, um, develop a training website to showcase the new feature suit themes so that as you're training people, you have a training website that you can throw content in and show how these different features work without affecting live content. Uh, as you review sites uh, that are ready for relaunch, um, it'll be helpful to have canned suggestions for site improvements, um, you know, pre-launch pre review notes, so that 
if you find yourself telling everybody over and over again, you need to put alt text on your images, have a canned response for that so you're making sure you say you say the same thing. And that canned response gets better and better over time as you fine tune it. Um, So the migration process at UMaine was lengthy. The 80-20 rule comes to mind. 80% uh, of the site migrations took 20% of our overall time, and vice versa. Um, sites making up a majority of our web traffic were migrated into this design by the start of fall semester, uh, yeah, 2017. Um, one year after, no, 2016. I remember this wrong there. But yeah, one year after initial launch. Uh, in comparison, our last year of migrations focused on niche sites that made up less than 5% of our overall traffic. So we finally kind of set a line in the sand and said, hey, we've got to shut off this whole WordPress server. And uh, we actually had some sites that disappeared because either people couldn't or be bothered to get in touch with us, or it turned out that the site was no longer needed because everybody that had been working on it went away. So some of these sites were migrated into our new design and still haven't been launched. Uh, UMaine, uh, we had a number of notable websites outside of WordPress theme. I mentioned see the Graduate School, uh, Climate Change Institute, Center on Aging, College of Marine Sciences. All of these were proactively con contacted by our team to migrate into our designs. I'm sorry, they contacted us. Um, each was its own project where we drew upon the communications framework uh, to ensure we could accommodate the site into our theme. And the Climate Change Institute website was launched in August of this year as the fall semester began. So we now have really everything that is UMaine.edu is now in WordPress, which is great. So where to go next? At UMaine, we continue the whole weekly WordPress training. That's been a game changer for us. Um, pre previously, we would have a series of these, like six times a year we would do WordPress training. Uh, but by doing it weekly, and on the same time every week, it just, you know, I go places now at campus and they'll say, oh yeah, your famous WordPress training. You know, they'll, they, it, word has gotten out that it happens Thursdays at 10 a.m. And we take walk-ins. We'd like people to tell us they're coming, but, you know, we just, people just show up. Um, it helps the community see digital communications as a resource. And uh, you know, each team member has, a, has had the opportunity now to be seen as a subject matter expert uh, in matters pertaining to the web. It gets us visibly out there that you know, people see that you know, we're the people that they go to for web. Even if it's web stuff that isn't WordPress, they'll still want us to chime in on. Uh, we now, just at the beginning of this year, send out a monthly email newsletter to all administrators on our multi-site network. Uh, we use MailChimp uh, for free. And my server administrator sends me an updated list of administrators every month, uh, which I use to automatically add new subscribers. Uh, we have a big blurb at the very top of the newsletter that says, you are receiving this because you are an administrator of a WordPress website. Um, no, you know, there's an unsubscribe button and people can, but we ask them if you don't want to receive this new, basically we don't say if you don't want to receive this newsletter any longer. We say, if you don't want to be a WordPress administrator any longer, <laughs> click here and we'll take you out of WordPress and you won't get this newsletter anymore. And we've had people do that. It's been great. Um, <laughs> seriously, we, we have 900 people in our WordPress environment. We used to have like 1,200 people, um, all sorts of administrators. When we first started this process, uh, I got bounce backs from people who were no longer on campus and nobody had told us, so they were still administrating the system. They could have gone and logged in uh, using their credentials and done who knows what to that website. It's just you know, we just had a security talk. Um, you just, you know, we're lucky in that you know, it's a very ethical community that doesn't do that. Um, but now we get announced, you know, we get bounce backs when people aren't there anymore, and uh, you know, we take them out. And uh, yeah, we get, uh, we hear from users that no longer need access, um, and it keeps, you know, keeps, keeps us up to date on that. So that's. The spiel. Uh, it took me about 25 minutes. I've got 10 minutes for questions. So, yeah. Uh, how easy or difficult was it to migrate the non-WordPress sites into 
the UMAIN WordPress community? Was there, did they come kicking and screaming, or was it very easy? Um, or somewhere in between? It, I, I could say uh, they, well, some of them came begrudgingly, but I wouldn't call it, characterize it as kicking and screaming. Uh, in all cases, they came to us, notably because they had all, with, uh, with one exception, they had all been um, in another content management system by a company uh, in Maine that was great when they, you know, came up, they built their sites in the mid-2000s. Right. Um, and that company said, hey, WordPress is great, we're not building our own CMS anymore. So finally in 2016 or 17, they were told, there's not going to be any more updates to this content management system, you really should move to something else. And that's when they got in touch with us to say, yeah, we got to move anyway, so let's move to WordPress. Um, we were able, our focus for those sites was to get their news into WordPress automatically. Um, so Climate Change Institute is an example um, where there were hundreds of news posts over the years. And we had, uh, we made some changes to their content management system, RSS feed. So it was giving us everything from the beginning of time. And then we used that RSS feed to create posts in WordPress, and that worked out great. Um, we were able to save them a, you know, a lot of time on stuff that was very um, low value for them to manually migrate. Pages, we had them manually recreate, because it was an opportunity for them to make sure they were moving things that um, actually they needed. Um, and that was part of our kind of our can spiel for site migrations in general, was um, use, before you move, audit your site and pull down anything that's not needed. You, you, you don't want to pack up something in a box to take it to a new house and then wonder why you packed it. Uh, when we moved to Maine in 2000, I was opening up a box of kitchen stuff and there was a juice, you know, an orange juice squeezer for oranges. And I was like, why did I pack this and bring it to Maine? Um, <laughs> you know, I don't care. Works great in Florida, not so great in Maine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um. When you guys did the migration and launched the site, did you see um, a, a big dip in traffic or analytics to the site after the launch? It's tough to answer that. Um, <laughs> we kind of did, but we're not sure how much of it was actual traffic changes mm -hmm. uh, due to the site moving and or how, uh, how we're measuring traffic. And, our old UA theme um, had a Google Analytics code hard coded into it. Every site was getting this one analytics code. And there was an opportunity to put your own code in. So there was, and so we had subdomain sites like um, english.umain.edu who had necessarily had their own analytics code. But they were also getting our catch all Google Analytics code. So an about us page for English, english.umain.edu slash about and umain.edu slash about, we're getting counted as the same page. So there was some traffic changes, but I was just telling everyone that it, it's becoming more accurate. <laughs> so, uh, I would say uh, just in general, uh, we did see a uh, bounce rate going down with the new site. We saw a much better experience, uh, much better experience with mobile, you know, we measured mobile users. And um, our new site, now we get a majority of traffic from mobile. Uh, and that just wouldn't have been possible with the old theme because people would have come to us from mobile but not stuck around because it was a terrible mobile experience. Yes? Did the vendor help with the internal communications that you outlined as far as I and getting the stakeholders involved? Or was that all? That was really, our, that was in our wheelhouse. So, yeah, we, we had our vendor focused on coding. Um, and we, we picked a vendor that was specifically WordPress centric because we didn't want to hire a vendor that would want to take us a step back to reinvent the wheel um, of, well, should you be using this content management system instead? Um, and that was really the key is they went off to do their work and they weren't really pinging us for input as much in that June time period, which really gave us breathing room to really flesh out that community. Um, I will say the vendor did do a great job of uh, training the trainers, and we used that training session that they gave us in the new theme as the basis for our WordPress 101 training as to what order to do things in. We really have really had 
nice flow to it, and we still use that framework today. Yes? I find the hardest thing is to get people to clean up their old site and all the content. How did you manage that, and how did you get people to do that on a timely manner? Mm -hmm. And the other question I had was about um, redirections. Did you do a lot of that? Or, you know, like if they were getting rid of a page, did you make sure that they were being redirected or not? So, the, for the first part, um, we had a batch process that we would have people on a timeline of, you know, week one, you're going to prepare your site by deleting old content. Week two, you attend our training. Week three, we've migrated your snapshot and given you access to it in the new site. And then we give you two weeks and we want to launch you. That was wildly optimistic for the majority of sites. Um, some small sites, they were ready sooner and they, we launched them. But other sites took maybe a year to migrate, which was opened up a whole can of worms because they had been making changes to their live site that then needed to be reflected in the in-progress site. We actually had one site that had to do a snapshot a couple of times to refresh before they could make the time to launch. Um, we really wanted to make sure that our, our point to them was we wanted it to be, at, at, at worst, a step sideways for them. In other words, uh, we didn't want them to be feeling like they were taking a step backwards in how their site was functioning when they launched. Instead, but at the same time, we did. We told them, don't try to make this like, it's going to be amazing that we're in the new design because look how much better our site is. Get your site in the new design and then work on the amazing part because you it, that time period we have two sites is, is really a headache. So as far as, what was the second part of your question? Redirections. Redirections. So sites, uh, a little bit. Um, but we didn't go crazy. What we would tell for people for large sites in particular was we looked at Google Analytics for entrance pages. And the entrance pages, we made sure that there's URLs would stay the same because they're migrating from WordPress to WordPress. Um, and we tell them, don't change the names of your site pages arbitrarily if they're a good entrance page. Um, so we would make redirects for entrance pages that were changing. But a lot of those, we just let the search engine, we would submit sitemaps to Google and Bing so that they knew where all the new pages were. But we didn't make an exhaustive redirect list. Okay, thank you. Did you have to chase people down for new content? Did people look at this as an opportunity to freshen their content? Because sometimes that's really such a bugaboo, trying mm -hmm. to get the content from the client. Yeah, so because we're migrating your, all your content as is, um, it was not as heavy a lift. Okay. But we did tell people, uh, we gave them some tools. Um, WordPress, uh, back in the day, would tell you, when pages were created, but not you have to go into the page to see what was last updated. And we exposed that last updated date into the page dashboard and it would tell people, sort your pages by last modified date. And that's where you start, is the pages that haven't been modified since 2010. Not that they were, you know, a page that was created in 2010 is fine if you're keeping it up to date. But even if you haven't touched that page in 2010, now's the time to take a look at it and decide, oh my gosh, this talks about, you know, President Kennedy. Um, <laughs> so we, you may have had a President Kennedy, so not that one, but you know, instead of you know, President Rini Mundi, who we have now. So um, that, you know, that was what we really geared people towards: was you know, look at your lap, look at your oldest content, uh, and then we did really try to get them to do a good job with their home pages and their hub pages, so that they were a better experience. Well, I think we're right about at the end here, and I can't believe I can't believe